Okay, in November 2010, the Fed announced it was resuming asset purchases to help revive a stagnant U.S. economy. Now, the stock market rallied, but bond yields rose, pushing down bond prices. And the reaction from economists, well, they were mixed. Joining us right now to talk about the Fed's future in 2011 are Vince Reinhardt. He's former director of monetary policy at the Fed, now resident scholar at AEI. He supports the Fed's move. Also with us, Charles Calamiris. He's a former consultant to the Fed, now a professor at Columbia Business School. He was one of 23 economists who signed a letter to Ben Bernanke opposing the resumption of Fed asset purchases. So a great combination to talk about the, the Fed. Vince, I want to kick it out to you. You support the Fed's moves. How come? Uh, because the unemployment rate's nine and three quarters percent, inflation is low, and and uh, there were risks it would go lower, and that there would be a considerable political risk if the Fed s sat on its hands in an environment in which there was economic distress. So it, the only game in town is quantitative easing, expanding the size of its balance sheet, which it's done before to good effect, and it could do it again. You know, Charlie, people say the Fed's the only one that's got some tools left to play with. You agree or you don't? I mean, you guys, you. You were part of the open letter to the Fed saying enough is enough, basically. No, I, I always agreed that, that they had a tool left, but that tool is called raising inflation expectations, which is what they did and what I predicted the consequence would be. That as soon as they announced quantitative easing, what we saw was a reaction. Inflation expectations, Michigan annual uh, index rose from 2.2 to 3 percent. Right. And that's what's pushed the bond yields up. And I, I argued all along that would be the effect, but I didn't think it was a good idea. I also agree with Vince that this is largely about politics. Um, my main uh, opposition to this is that it creates an inflation risk. Mm. Now, the, the way that it creates an inflation risk, it's not a huge inflation risk, but it's a tail risk. That is, if the economy surprises to the upside, and if interest rates rise and bank lending starts to rise, right. we're going to be in a situation where, believe it or not, the Fed could be insolvent. 50 basis points more upward movement in interest rates, the Fed is insolvent on a market value basis. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, will the Fed be willing to contract its balance sheet and thereby recognize that insolvency? I think not. So they could be caught flat-footed. The alternatives, there are alternatives for contracting even without shrinking their balance sheet, but they're not very pretty. So I think actually they were talking about getting rid of a left tail risk, right. deflation, but they actually bought us into a right tail risk. You know, Vince, Charlie lays out a pretty dire scenario potentially for the, the Fed. You buy into that scenario? Oh, I think there are lots of risks associated with quantitative easing, no doubt, and it importantly depends on the execution. And I would say that the FOMC doesn't get good grades on the way it executed uh, quantitative easing in November. It could have been much more rule-like and provided reassurance that there'd be an automatic exit. But it, it wanted to keep its, its hand free. It wanted to be able to use discretion. That's a real risk. I think the tail risk really is all about politics. It's all about that po if the yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, that the Fed buys so much so many Treasury securities at a later date as the economy starts improving and there are market concerns about about fiscal issuance, the Fed might be reluctant to rein in its balance sheet and add to those pressures. And it may be worried about uh, losses on its balance sheet. As Professor Calamaris knows, a central bank that issues a fiat currency really shouldn't worry about its capital position. But there are perception issues also political issues. The problem is if the Fed is insolvent, it mm. might have to appeal to Congress and How, the Treasury. You keep saying that. How likely is something like that? Quite likely. How likely is it that interest rates will rise 50 basis points over the next year or two? Pretty easily. Okay, well that's sure. according to Bob Eisenweiss's estimates, that's what it would take to make the Fed insolvent on a market value basis. Now they don't do market value <laughs> marking mm. in their portfolio, but if they ever have to sell, and remember the Fed's going to have after quantitative easing let's say 2.6 trillion. Mm -hmm. Well, 1 trillion of that is unsale mortgage-backed securities. Not easily sold, Okay. Right? Yeah. Then another uh, almost a trillion is medium and long-term treasuries. So how do you sell? What do you sell if interest rates rise without having to mark that balance sheet down? I mean, none of this sounds good, Vince. But, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, but I, th I think Charlie has identified why, when it comes time to tighten, the Fed won't do it by shrinking its balance sheet. It doesn't want to admit losses. Uh, and the, and the, the genius of central bank accounting is it doesn't mark to market. Uh, so that most likely when the time comes to tighten monetary policy, they'll do it by raising the rate they pay on, on reserves. 
counting on being able to tighten policy with a big balance sheet. But, but the, there are problems in all the alternatives. Uh, Vince just sure. mentioned raising interest rates. Of course, the problem there is how much will they have to raise interest rates? Now, if the money multiplier bounces back, if the, de if the desire by mm -hmm. banks to supply loans bounces back a lot, because it's at a historic low right now, the money multiplier. Right. So suppose you look at 1939 to 41. Money uh, loans grew by 20 percent in commercial banks. This is the kind of rubber band bouncing back that I think we can expect. You know, and the amount that interest rates would have to rise on excess reserves would be so large that it would also create huge insolvency problems. You know, here we sit in December 2010, so easy to kind of criticize the Fed in terms of some of its policies. But if you go back to the crisis, I mean, did the Fed, Charlie, have any uh, option other than to, to kind of do this to kind of help out the economy? Well, of course. I mean, the Fed panicked, It did basically. have options? Oh, of course. Now, if you look at the index of, of economic news from May to August of this year, it was all bad. It was going down this terrible slope. Right. And, and Bernanke basically panicked in his Jackson Hole speech. Then he's entrenched. He can't back off. The news reversed almost immediately, and we're up to pretty good news by September, October, November. But by then, he's already given his speech. There was no reason for this. And as I said, it's just bad risk management. I mean, Vince, you did say you supported it, but you didn't like the execution. I mean, again, I go back to the crisis. I mean, everybody wasn't really maybe thinking everything through. There wasn't a lot of time. I mean, did the Fed really have any other choice? Uh, if we're talking about their actions in 2008 and 2009, they had some choices and they made some bad decisions, starting with the decision to lend to Bear Stearns, which I view as the original sin. That's what mm. put uh, Too Big to Fail uh, squarely on the table and created Lehman as the event that it became. Uh, now, in 2010, did the Fed make mistakes? Sure. As Charlie uh, uh, correctly identified, they were behind the curve in, in the spring and summer in terms of mm -hmm. recognizing the mm -hmm. Um, the, the weakness of the data, and they had to spring back even more forcefully than probably was appropriate. Uh, I think the execution issue was they did quantitative easing, but didn't provide an automaticity to it. Okay. They didn't make mm -hmm. their decisions on the balance sheet conditioned on their outlook. They wanted to keep their discretionary hand in things. I, I agree and with that's him when on, they get in trouble. Hey, I agree with him on that. Right. If you're going to do it, to have it the uh, maximum effect, you have to announce a growth rate, you have to announce that you're going to grow until it works. There's got to be What we learned from the Japanese is you don't do this sort of waiting cautiously and right. throwing a few dollars here and hey, there. It doesn't work. Hey, you know, guys, we were talking in the break, and you brought up, Charlie, Ron Paul. Mm. I mean, that's going to be an interesting factor in terms of the future of the Fed and Ben Bernanke specifically. Oh, absolutely. Well, not only is it going to be great entertainment, <laughs> but it's also, I think, going to be a surprise to a lot of people. Ron Paul is perceived as a gold bug, a sort of, you know, throwback to the 19th century. But and actually, a little crazy. I mean, I think people... Maybe there is that perception. But actually, some of the issues he's raising about long-term price stability, uh, limiting Fed discretion, creating more rules-based policies, uh, those actually are very respectable issues. And once he learns the right jargon of mainstream economics and gets some good advice, I think, mm -hmm. he'll be able to channel a lot of his ideas in a very constructive direction. I mean, Vince, you agree? I mean, is Ron going to be, Ron Paul specifically, when he brings Ben Bernanke uh, before him in, in uh, you know, various uh, committees to, to talk to him? I mean, is it going to be productive uh, in terms of uh, the Fed? I think he's got the opportunity to be productive. Remember that survey you folks did about, about three weeks ago that 50% of the public distrust the Fed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of anger about the Fed. The question for politicians is, can they channel that anger in a productive way? And I think Ron Paul has the ability to do so by using the bully pulpit to, to force the Fed to take more responsibility for longer run price stability. Uh, he, he can do it, and I, I think there's, there, there's, there's there's good chance that that there are people on the Senate side too who who want who want to be able to say they reigned in the Fed, an institution that a lot of voters just don't trust. All right, we've got about a minute left, guys. I mean, so much to talk about. Um, so, Charlie, your your best guess, or best bet, if you will, on terms of what the Fed Fed policy is for 2011. Jeremy Siegel, we talked to, and mm -hmm. he says we could start to see QE2 unwound by June 30th. Maybe rates start to go higher. What do you think? Uh, well, let's say I'm a lot closer to Jeremy than I am to Bob Mundell, who I know was just on. Mm -hmm. So I think the economy is likely to surprise on the upside. I think you're going to see uh, sort of now with working out of some of the balance sheet problems, you're going to see lending starting up again in the banks. Rates gonna... go up by the Fed? Yes. Oh, long-term rates are going to go up. The, the Fed funds rate, I think the Fed will be very slow to raise it. Okay. The long-term rates, I think, are going to rise. But that's, as Jeremy pointed out, that's an indication of uh, growth and right. also higher inflation expectations. 
Vince, save 20 seconds for you. Your outlook for the Fed in terms of raise QE2, just quickly. They, they, they do all QE2 because they don't want to be seen as succumbing to outside pressure. Uh, and then they watch as the yield curve steepens as long rates go up, but they keep the short rate where it is for the rest of the year. They're going to have to be forced to tighten by events. But just quickly, guys, do we get a QE3 or is that off the table? Trump? I don't think so because, I, I mean, the, the big uncertainty is Europe. Europe is going to have more financial collapse, more problems. Right. Uh, that's going to be the negative news story in 2011. Uh, how much that matters for the U.S. economy is unclear. Right. And so my view is it's probably not on the table. Vince, you agree? Just five seconds here. I think there's a chance there will be QE3, and mm. it's going to be because the unemployment rate's above 9%. Uh, it, it was a political decision to do QE2. Okay. It was a, about perceptions. They're in that boat again next year. All right. We'll certainly uh, find out what happens uh, in a few months from now. Vince Reinhardt, Charles Calamiros, thank you, guys. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Talking the Fed there. Tesla.